Previously on the all new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. So, next month. Yes! Because I don't know what we're doing next month. You don't. <laughs> no! Okay. I wanted to uh, read a Doctor that we haven't read yet, so. Yes. I decided to go with a 10th Doctor novel. Yes. Or a collection of novellas, really. Ooh, okay. We're going with the story of Martha. Oh! Oh dear. Alright. We find out what Martha was up to during her year on Earth fighting the Taclophane. Okay, okay. Uh, that's set in my least favorite finale. Yeah, okay. Well, 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 this is unexpected. I think Martha deserves a little bit more love compared to uh, Donna and, and Rose. Yeah. At least it's not set in the end of time. It could be worse. And now our story continues. Adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. This is Matt in Minnesota. Chris in South London. Hello. Welcome. It's uh, February. It is. It is. It's February, and uh, it, it, the days are starting to get that little bit longer in the UK. And so it'll be a bit ambitious to say spring is on its way, but uh, this is, tends to be the time of year when, if it's going to snow, this will be when. Yeah, no, things are good. Things. Are good. Minneapolis is uh, hosting the Super Bowl this weekend, mm. so the uh, town is basically shut down, and it's the coldest Super Bowl ever on record, which is like <laughs> I think negative five degrees or something. <laughs> Like yes. that Fahrenheit. Yes. Um, so it's very cold here still. But uh just wanted to welcome all of our new listeners who mm. may have first heard of us at Gallifrey One this month. And uh, just a quick note of congratulations, Chris, uh, or self-congratulations, mm-hmm. I should say. We've been now doing this for a full year. This is our 12th monthly episode. So Yay! Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Welcome. Welcome one and all. Do you have anything for uh, show and tell this month? I do. I do. Um, And it's something that is hardly up to date. I recently, for the very first time, listened to The Marion Conspiracy from Big Finish, which is um, a Six Doctor audio. It's um, it's Evelyn's debut story. And I thought it was brilliant relatively early in the Big Finish run. And uh, for some reason, I'd never got around to listening to it. The first 50 big finish monthly range stories are um, uh, are available at reduced rate they were super reduced over christmas um but uh, most of them you can get for i think it's something like two pound fifty two pound ninety nine that kind of price range um obviously those prices may vary in other territories it's a really compelling listen um it's sort of a historical uh, set during the reign of queen mary it's it's great have you ever heard that one i've listened to all the big finishes up through zagreus for sure and i think i think that was their 50th title and at least in the monthly range i i think it was up to uh or number 100 okay. where uh nick briggs took over from gary russell for the producing and then i've kind of dipped in and out mainly focusing on some of like the special one-off miniseries they've done mm-hmm. yeah marion conspiracy was a was a great one and that one was a was that a pure historical it is yeah on reflection it is yes well there's, there's a sci-fi element but that's really kind of just by virtue of it being a Doctor Who story. I uh, had the good fortune to meet Maggie Stables once at a convention stateside. Uh, I think it was in Chicago one year. Um, she was a really brilliant lady. Mm. Great companion. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. I think well worth a listen if, uh, if, if, if you have not had the time, dear listener. 
So, how about how about you, Matt? Have you got anything to show and tell? Uh, yeah, just a quick announcement um, and a kind of an exciting bit of news from Console Room, which is the Doctor Who convention that's local to the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's fifth year this year, and they just announced the entire Paternoster gang will be at Console Room. Oh, cool! So that's like a big uh, get for for mm. us um, after. Peter Davison canceled last year. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we're going to have Nev McIntosh or Neve McIntosh. I think she, it's how yeah, it's pronounced. Yeah, I think it's Neve, yeah. Ma- Madam Vastra, Dan Starkey, Strax, and then uh, Katrin Stewart as uh, Jenny. Hmm. And you would think that, speaking of Big Finish, that the Paternoster gang would have featured in their own Big Finish series by now. But we've only had uh, guest appearances from two of the the gang and other um, characters' spinoffs. Mm-hmm. Vastra appeared in, I think, Churchill Volume 2, and Strax is only in a one-off um, Jago and Lightfoot special. It's kind of weird to think that Churchill got a spinoff before before these three. <laughs> but um, but maybe Big Finish wasn't able to use them regularly until the Moffat era was over or something. So hopefully we'll see more from, from these three. Yeah, hopefully so. I mean, there is also a, um, a Strax uh, audio book that I think does touch upon the Paternosa gang, but that's kind of narrated by Dan Starkey. Mm. But I don't think that it came from Big Finish. But uh... I think Dan Starkey's written some other Big Finish audios too like mm. in their in their main range so he's kind of moving into writing territory in addition to um being an actor so mm. it's pretty cool should we um remind the lovely people of what we've been reading this month so this month we are reading the story of martha which is by dan abnett and it features contributing works from four different authors and i think when mm-hmm. we get to the the four stories we'll talk a little bit about the different authors in the range mm-hmm. we've discussed dan abnett before he wrote uh, the silent stars go by and he was um, instrumental in revamping the guardians of the galaxy series and kind of relaunching that for marvel mm-hmm. and he wrote the framing uh story to this this one's an interesting one because uh it has freema adjaman doing the narration for four of the short stories but didn't narrate the linking material so it's, it's kind of disjointed that way but um i did get a hardcover of, mm-hmm. of this and i have to say i really like the hardcover style that they used to have with the ninth and tenth doctor books before they switched to paperback they're back to the hardcovers for the 12th doctor and bill but it's kind of a larger format size but these earlier books they remind me a little bit of like the the lemony snicket or the series of unfortunate events <laughs> books just how nicely they're presented and i, I kind of miss that a little bit <laughs> with yeah. with some of the newer books Shall we? Uh, Shall we begin? Jump into this story. Yeah, yeah. The story begins with uh, Martha sort of arriving as a passenger in a small boat from uh, Dunkirk to the English coastline, and uh, she's uh, been made making this journey in secret. And she's met by um, Tom Milligan, who because uh, this bit is kind of is taken from Last of the Time Lords. Uh, and uh, and uh, Tom Milligan, uh, you may know better now as Lucifer uh, from the uh, TV oh. series. So Martha is meeting the devil, so to speak. <laughs> um, and so it's uh, and she sort of says it's been 365 days since her journey began. So um, uh, it's, it's her first time back in England in over a year. And so we then flashback to uh, events of one year earlier and during those events martha escapes the valiant uh i think it was using jack's teleporter the same one clara uses in the 50th Mm. and she um teleports down to the surface and the book kind of opens with her being on the run for a couple of weeks and she's being chased by this is i think they're called ucf is is that the acronym I think they're just called Overwatch, or that's mm. kind of the, the group. The new master-led fascist regime mm. that's um, taken over the world. And so Martha's kind of on the run for two weeks. And we, we do get some good references back to 2007 in this section, like things like, uh, you know, scattered DVD shelves, and, <laughs> uh, components of different Wii's being left around, and no smartphones. So there's, mm. it's weird to think that that world was, you know, 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we do get some good information about how perception filters work too. So she's being pursued by um, this guy with like a scar down his face, whose name is mm. Griffin, and he's um, hot on Martha's trail. And he's trying to figure out how her perception filter works. And you know, she wears her TARDIS key, and she kind of disappears from sight. There were a couple 
things here that didn't really ring true to me just in in the opener like would it really take Martha two weeks to figure out that oh I need to ditch my heels and not <laughs> run around in heels and 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 where has she been um getting perfume the last few weeks you know because that's one of the ways that uh, Griffin's able to and like the pack of dogs that is chasing her is able to um sense her is like oh I, I left my perfume on and the perception filter doesn't work with smells so I was just like oh <laughs> It, 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 I don't think it would have taken Martha that long to um to figure all that out. But she runs into this little girl who's been surviving like mm. on spoiled yogurt pots and convenience stores, leftovers. She manages to like bring the girl to like a refugee camp or something that that's kind of just getting started up. And she um, decides to tell uh, the girl a story to inspire her. Yeah, and uh, so that story is called The Weeping, and uh, it's brought to us by uh, David Roden, who um, his uh, first contribution to uh, The Wonderful World of Doctor Who was co-writing Dimensions in Time. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he also wrote uh, a Tenth Doctor and Donna audiobook and did some work for the Marvel Doctor Who yearbooks. Yes. That brings us to our first dramatic reading. This is taken from the, the four short stories that were narrated by Freema Adjaman, and this is available on iTunes, Audible, wherever you get downloadable books. But this is just a short scene of the Doctor and Martha receiving a warning and they're translating the warning in the TARDIS. A blue box spun through the iridescent shimmer of the vortex, buffeted on all sides by the time winds. Inside the blue box, the impossibly vast organic chamber was suffused with a greenish light that emanated from pulsing circuits rammed higgledy-piggledy under a metal-grilled floor. And either side of the jumbled central control console were two figures, Martha Jones and the Doctor. So it's a warning, then, Martha ventured. With a flourish of his right hand, the Doctor tipped a switch upwards, snorted, and peered anxiously at the scanner mounted on the console. Glasses now on, he rapped the screen with his knuckles. Sounds like a warning to me, she said. Nah, the Doctor retorted. Nothing like a warning. An incoherent babble of distorted voices crackled from an ancient speaker grill near the scanner. The doctor tugged an ink pen from his inside suit pocket and began scribbling furiously on a notepad. Well, it's not a mayday, and it's not junk mail. Come on, come on, what are you? The symbols he scribbled were strange, spidery and archaic, like alien shorthand. Ah! he exclaimed, straightening up and beaming his best toothy grin. Gotcha! He hopped backwards onto one of the two pilot seats at the edge of the console, swinging his long legs back and forth underneath him. That's brilliance, that is, Martha Jones. An unknown alien language deciphered in less than, what, ten seconds? He waved the pad under Martha's nose. Oh, yes! He grinned, and then realised that Martha was staring at him, unimpressed. What? And then his voice notched up a touch. What? Martha looked at him. It's a warning, isn't it? Yes, he said, a touch shamefaced. Martha laughed and poked him in the ribs. Yeah, so Dr. Martha arriving on this planet called um, Agaleos uh, in response to a warning signal. Uh, so apologies on the pronunciation. I, I read this rather than listened to it. So uh, my my pronunciations might not quite match up to, uh, to Martha's. To Freema, pardon me. Uh, but yeah, the human colony here had been kind of established because there was a um, wormhole nearby which um, endowed them with psychic powers. Uh, and so the Doctor and Martha, they were kind of wandering across an icy landscape and they arrive in the, the settlement, but they're being kind of chased by all these kind of monstrous creatures. Uh, and then they're saved by an old man called Weicher, or Weichter, and uh, he kind of takes them to a kind of a tower in the middle of the town. And, um, and Weichter explains that he's the last survivor of the colonists, and as such, he's the guardian of the beacon that's uh, sending out the warning signal. His name is a corruption of the word watcher. Yes, 
he's been there for many, many years. Um, and Martha and the doctor remarked that he's like the oldest person they've ever seen. And he's um, psychically linked to this beacon with like a piece of hardware mm. implanted in his body that's keeping him young or well, keeping him alive at the very least yes and uh, basically he just wants to kind of return to home and die which is um nice so the doctor uh sort of says that they'll kind of help him uh, and so he kind of sets out to uh, distract the beasts whilst uh, martha uh, takes uh, white back to the tardis uh, White kind of collapses in the snow, uh, and but they manage to kind of get him into um, the TARDIS. And whilst in the, the doctor tries to kind of remove the chip, and then realizes that there's kind of like a problem that um, White will die if they if they actually kind of continue on removing the chip. It's a form of death because it turns out the kind of the twist of the story mm. is that all these other creatures that are on this planet on this colony world are um, evolutions or de-evolutions of the the colonists that were there so watcher watcher whatever her however mm. his name is pronounced by removing that ship he's starting to change into like one of these um almost like were creatures mm. that are on this planet and it's it's kind of this dilemma of you know does the doctor allow this person to to go through the transformation and become this monster or does he stop the creature and this guy's mm. kind of trapped in the same cycle with the beacon mm. and i think they ultimately land on the doctor and martha allowing the transformation to occur and i think that's what he what he wants too isn't it yeah so it's white's choice as to, and so he kind of like uses psychic paper yeah he decides to change so that he's not going to be alone yeah there ends the story i think yeah and why on earth would martha <laughs> tell this to, to a little girl <laughs> Well, this, this this kind of like this story with like lots of body horror in it, similar yes. to like the fly or Kafka's metamorphosis. It's like I'm going to comfort you by <laughs> yeah, giving you a horrific story, and which also she tells entirely in the third person, so uh, she comes across as quite egotistical. Yeah, because <laughs> like I, I must say I was expecting these Martha narratives to be in the first person if she's telling these stories. Yeah, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's almost as if they figured out what the framework was after everyone had written in the book and written the, their components they got a handful of short stories and thought well this isn't enough to make an anthology but yeah yes this is quite like full circle um but we can't make a book out of it <laughs> i also didn't really care for how similar thematically this was to the season finale in the framing material mm. having the ancient man unable to die that's what happened with the the dobby doctor Yes. On the Valiant. And evolving into the monster is the exact same twist used with the Toclofame. Yeah. So it's a, it's a perfectly fine little short story. But if I was the editor, I'd, I think I would exclude this because certain story beats are too similar to Sound of Drums and Last of the Time Lords. Yeah. It just doesn't feel different enough. And, and as you say as well, it just, why do you give this story to a nine-year-old? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, martha having traumatized alicia uh takes a cold shower to wash off her perfume i don't think we're told whether she gets any other perfume or whether it's just now it's just kind of the scent of martha for the remainder of the uh, the year so anyway she um she kind of stays um for a few hours and sort of tells the people some more stories about the doctor yeah i don't think we're told them martha's dropping the girl off at a refugee camp in battersea yeah and and uh, they exchange gifts. Martha gives her sparkly earrings, which were kind of showing through the perception filter as well. Mm. The girl gives Martha a little plastic badge that says, mm. Hooray, I am nine years old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Martha then makes her way into uh, France. Yes. So she's heading uh, east. And she, um, there are these things called um, flash markets, which are like black market sort of stands that kind of spring up. Everyone does their business really quickly before Overwatch is able to detect them, and then the market disappears right away. Yeah, it's very much like a flash mob. Uh, it's very 2007. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh is uh, flash mobs are very much the same griffin from overwatch is still mm. following her and he catches up to her at this flash market and martha's meeting a contact named matthew uh spelled the french way oh, mateo or mateo, mateo. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or matthew <laughs> matthew yeah so she meets up with her contact but mm. um she kind of notices that hey 
Overwatch is circling this thing and they're going to start firing off guns and killing people. So she gives out an early warning and saves a lot of lives, not everyone's. Um, mm. Some of this is kind of a little grisly. Mm. And uh, Martha and Matthew, or <laughs> M- Matthew, uh, they run off together in a van um, mm. being pursued by Griffin, who's kind of firing a gun after them. Mm. It's a Citroen van, of course, it being France. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Uh, and so like, the windscreen kind of gets shot out and um, Theo or Matthew uh, manages to kind of make it to a survivor camp. And so Martha's kind of tending his wounds. And so she thinks, yay, it's another case for story time. <laughs> uh, story time with <laughs> Dr. Martha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, we now have uh, Breathing Space, uh, written by Paul Lewis and uh, Steve Lockley, I believe. And they've written a number of sci-fi and horror books together, but I think this is their only contribution to Doctor Who. No. Is it not? No, no oh. it's not. It's not. They also wrote uh, War and Time of Peace for Short Trips Destination Prague, which seems quite niche. I mean, uh, Prague, is a, <laughs> Prague is a wonderful city, I'm sure. I've never been. I, I don't know whether, you can, whether the world was really itching to have, um, have a book of short stories all set in Prague but uh, yeah that's yeah. something we haven't touched on before so in addition to the three um, short trips books that the BBC did hmm. uh, Big Finish ended up publishing I think 30 volumes of short trips work and some of them got really esoteric in there <laughs> yeah, like a, a collection of stories all set in Prague yes <laughs> it was like okay so the editor must have gone to Prague really liked it and <laughs> said so, Yes. Let's, set, let's set a whole book here. Yes. Hi, Eric, if he's listening to this from Prague. Um, oh, is, that's right. Yeah. yeah. One of the hosts of the first version of this program uh, now, now resides in the Czech capital. So this story opens, it's a space station orbiting Earth in mm. 2088. And the the plot of this short story reminds me quite a bit of V. With the, you have, <laughs> like these these uh, benefactors contacting the human race saying, hey, we've got your get out of climate change free card. Um, <laughs> you can use our technology at no cost to you. And we'll, uh, we'll scrub the atmosphere with these bio ships called whales mm. that are kind of like this gaseous dough-like creatures that um, will kind of just sit in the atmosphere and take in all the bad gases, the greenhouse gases, mm. and clean the atmosphere that way. And, and humanity is like, sure, sign us up for this. <laughs> yeah. And the Doctor and Martha land on the space station in the middle of the control room, which is, mm. is kind of like mission control. And this brings us to our next short dramatic reading. The Doctor is activating a fire alarm to cause a distraction, and we'll uh, listen to that here. They sprinted the last few yards and only just squeezed through before the doors closed with a heavy thud. Had there been any guards on the other side, she and the doctor would have run straight into them, but the corridor was deserted. Martha leaned against the wall, gulping down air, heart thumping. How she envied the doctor who, despite his nine hundred years, didn't seem at all out of breath. He flashed the sonic screwdriver over a keypad at the side of the doorway, fanning the air when sparks cascaded out and a scorching smell filled the corridor. Sorry, smoking, terrible habit. You're right, Martha, only you look a bit peaky. (sighs) I'm fine, she said. Her legs trembled so badly she could barely stand, but she didn't want to give him the satisfaction of knowing it, not with his warped sense of humour. What... what did you do back there? Fire alarm. Brilliant, eh? I noticed the sensors on the ceiling and knew the doors would close automatically because that's what always happens in the films. But we can't stand here guessing. Remember the way back to the TARDIS? Martha recalled the blur of endless corridors, lit by cold white overhead strip lights, remembered the lifts and all those left and right turns that had finally led them here. No, she said with a shake of her head. Sorry. The doctor flashed his teeth. Don't be. I need to get back there quickly and I want you to lead Grant's goons away. What do you want me to do? Just keep moving for as long as you can and stay on this floor. That way you can't inadvertently lead them to the TARDIS. They'll have the doors open before long, so the more time you can buy me, the quicker I can put things right. How bad is it? The doctor stared at her somberly. End of the world bad. Right. Well, perhaps you'd better get going, Dr Smith. I will, Dr Jones. 
Try to stay out of trouble. With that, he dashed down the corridor towards the nearest lift. All right, and the Doctor and Martha are running, and they've split up in the space station. Uh, Martha eventually gets captured by the chief of security and brought back to the bridge. Hmm. She buys the Doctor enough time for him to escape to the TARDIS, where he figures out what these creatures are, which they're called uh, Cenaria, and mm-hmm. they're like an alien race that evolved uh, in like a gas giant planet atmosphere so they're very vulnerable to um explosions they're they're essentially flammable so any like one spark would destroy their invasion fleet so they have to (laughs) in order for them to conquer planets they have to terraform them and kind of come in as uh benefactors yeah and uh, yeah so they get rid of everybody and then kind of exploit the resources what lovely people the doctor's able to monitor the the network of communications between the uh benefactors Mm. who are in a cloaked ship orbiting earth uh, not thousands of light years away like humanity thinks and he's able to trigger the attack pattern for the the whale ships so they form into a pattern to basically to gas the cities and release all the the gases they've been collecting in population areas to choke out humanity the doctor decloaks the invasion ship which causes the aliens to retreat because they were revealed mm-hmm. and they th- importantly they think it was the um the human race and not uh, the doctor who who saved them. Mm-hmm. And then the doctor says, you can thank me by saving the planet the hard way mm. and trying to fix climate change. And then he said, uh, you know, one of the whale creatures crashed into the ocean, so you may be able to retro uh, engineer some of the atmospheric scrubbing technology from it. So that's <laughs> kind of where the, the story ends. I thought this story was a little bit better than the first. It made I think more sense to be in this collection but <laughs> but now Martha has to explain time travel <laughs> and 2088 to those listening. Yes. Also doesn't really seem to be a super inspiring story after the the slaughter that happened in the marketplace. So again I'm running into this kind of where the the ongoing narrative feels disjointed from the the stories that are picked in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I can't really argue with that. I know you said it reminded you of V. It reminded me very much of um, Grant Morrison very early on in his Justice League run had a um, a story in which kind of aliens arrive and uh, yeah, they are the benefactors. And uh, it turns out, yeah, no, they're not. I think generally, you know, future generations, uh, if aliens arrive and if they say, "Oh, we're going to do you a big favor," don't trust them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 so then we go to the next part of kind of the framing story yeah. uh, of the year of Martha and mm. Martha and Matthew uh, they mm. go from camp to camp kind of across Europe um, yeah. by ATV uh, mm. staying one step ahead of Griffin and his UCF gang by sending um, false sighting reports across mm. the Archangel network. Mm. which they're able to kind of tap into. Martha throughout this is kind of telling more stories and asking others to be like her, to be their own Martha Jones. And some even claim that they are Martha Jones, just to kind of like further muddy the waters, uh, as you're kind of alluding. So it, it's it's almost like a kind of a um, you know, Spartacus moment. Yeah, definitely. One of the chapters ends with them appearing to get captured, mm. but it turns out they weren't captured after all. It was stopped by a different rebel cell, so it was a bit of a misdirection there. The narrative jumps ahead a few months, and Martha is flying above the Aegean Sea in uh, mm. western Russia, looking for a contact on the ground known only as the Brigadier. Mm. <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, so she arrives uh, sort of in Turkey, and she's going to be deposited um, at, at the meeting place, and she's been told that the code word is Benton uh, by the pilot. Um, but also we know that nearby Griffin and his men are watching for the helicopter, and so like the net is drawing in on Martha. Um, but uh, the underground folk are ahead of the game, uh, she's been told to kind of go and meet them at this hill, um, but the hill uh, isn't a um, isn't like a real place. It's kind of a code name um, for uh, the underground's kind of rendezvous points. She meets up with the brigadier, whilst Griffin's men are kind of like searching with the hills, and the brigadier is not Leopard um, <laughs> Stewart, but it's uh, some bloke called Eric Calvin. And I was really hoping it would be uh, Brigadier Bambera myself. Mm. I thought that would have been really cool. That would, that would have been good. 
Yeah, that, that that would have been a good twist, but instead it's somebody who I don't think we've ever heard of. He says his uh, father was in uh, some some of the adventures with the third Doctor in Unit, but hmm. I wasn't tracking on the last name, so I, I don't know any like Unit regulars back in the day that were named Calvin no. or even one-offs. So. I don't remember, I must say. It, 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 it does feel like a bit of a missed opportunity, um, mm-hmm. a tiny bit, not to kind of time in a bit closer. Um, he asks Martha um, if she's got a weapon to kill the Master, and uh, she says, but she hasn't. And um, But it's not the Doctor's way to kind of use weapons to kill the Master, um, apart from when it suits them. She says that yeah, it's probably not a bad thing to let the rumour persist that some weapon like that exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, they decide to kind of carry on with the Doctor's plan, spreading stories about the Doctor so that one day he can use the um, the Archangel comm system against him. Martha makes the suggestion to the Brigadier, hey, you should include some tales about the third Doctor. And then I thought mm. to myself, well, why don't we get one of those? <laughs> <laughs> why don't we get one of those included? Because <laughs> yes, that would be more, maybe more fun. Um, but, uh, yes. But yeah, though it had probably been written by Terence Dix and it might have kind of stuck out like a sore thumb with the rest of these. Uh, one quick aside, just uh, real quick on Terence Dix. Um, yeah. He did write a couple of short, shorter novels called Quick Reads mm. for, I think, both for the 10th Doctor, one with the 10th Doctor and Martha, and I think the other one was with Rose. But there was an interesting little, I forget what it is, but you get the... Terrence Dick's uh, target description of what he would have used for the 10th Doctor, similar, <laughs> similar to like the plain open face for the 5th Doctor. But um, kind of an interesting publishing twist, the mm. Terrence Dick's um, story he wrote with Martha in it preceded her debut on television by about three months or so. Oh, It was the, the very first appearance of Martha is, is by Terrence Dick's. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's not the first time that Terence Dix has kind of preempted um, TV because the Five Doctors uh, as a book, I think, was released before the TV version was broadcast. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, no, there there is a precedent. Six months in, mm. and Martha has reached Japan. Yay! <laughs> so this this gets a reference, I think, in the in the TV. Yeah, it it does. And one thing that the BBC have to do, as I, I think as part of their charter, but certainly it, they have to make sure that if they are if they have spin off stuff, that you can watch or listen to the original material broadcast for free on the BBC without your having to have purchased other material to understand it. So certainly, I mean, you, know, you do not have to have read this to um, to enjoy is a strong word, but appreciate Last of the Time Lords. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Last of the Time Lords, as I said last time, it is not a favourite story of mine. In fact, I just like it so much that my favourite moment that I described last time was um, the Dalek speaking German, which of course is not from Last of the Time Lords. So uh, yes, I put myself through Sound of Drums to just to uh, get myself in the mood for this uh, and I just watched another 10 minutes of Last of the Time I was like, no, that's it, I've had enough <laughs> <laughs> Sorry I think the uh, the best part of Sound of Drums is I think that's where we get the appearance of Gallifrey in that flashback mm. right? Yes, I think that's, that's the highlight of that episode for me Yes, <laughs> yes, sorry Japan, yes <laughs> Martha's in Japan and mm. This is where the guidance systems are being built for the rockets that the uh, master is constructing. Martha looks for her contact, but they never show up. So Mm. she has to make new plans to try and get into one of the labor camp domes. And as she gets closer to these work domes, her perception filter fails. And she gets picked up by the local guard squad. Mm. And she gets sent to a dome where she works for weeks at a time welding two chips together. Mm -hmm and um on an assembly line and it's looking pretty grim she's kind of trapped there Mm. but she finally has enough strength after a couple weeks to tell a story to the other workers there and this part reminded me a little bit of at least the the descriptions of like the workplace and stuff reminded me a little of like some of those undercover exposés that you hear about like foxconn and (laughs) (laughs) uh, yes work in in china like those conditions it's like yeah. uh, very uh scary so we move on to the frozen wastes by mm. uh robert Sherman. yes yeah he's rob Sherman's a very uh, i think a very well known or well, hopefully a very well known author i mean he's um more known for his audio plays than um than for his kind of book work uh as such um did jubilee sort of holy terror 
uh, Maltese penguin, uh, amongst others, but especially Chimes of Midnight, which uh, I think is possibly my favourite Big Finish audio story. It's like the original Doctor Who Christmas special in a way. It is. It, it, it's fabulous. I first heard it one Christmas, uh, and uh, yeah, it just p- p- shivers up the spine. And he's also uh, co-written Running Through Corridors with uh, Toby mm. Hado, which I'm still waiting on volume three of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it took a long time for volume two to come out. Um, you referenced, um, I think, the uh, Audio Play 100 from Big Finish. So he wrote one part of that as well, My Own Private Wolfgang, about um, um, Mozart um, uh, um, living to a, uh, to a historically inaccurate long age. Yes, so we go from a uh, wasteland to a frozen wasteland. The frozen wastes. <laughs> the fro- a frozen wasteland was also the same as our first story. I wish there were more variety. <laughs> yeah. From one setting to the same setting. <laughs> But uh, this story starts out, Martha breaks her arm as a little girl. Her brother, mm. uh, Leo, who we've seen in the series, is kind of pushing her too hard on a swing, and she falls off or jumps and, and breaks her arm. And at that moment, she decided she wanted to become a doctor. <laughs> and we get a... Um... Curious insight into her teenage mind, because um, yeah. instead of having posters of kind of like pop singers of the 90s, um, she instead has <laughs> covers her walls with pictures of uh, anatomy <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and the internal workings of the body. Oh, yeah, it takes all sorts, doesn't it? <laughs> we intercut Martha's experiences as a, mm. as a child and kind of her hopes and dreams with a uh, child in the 1800s in France named Pierre, who mm. um, only dreams of the color white and doesn't have any other dreams whatsoever and he goes to an exhibition in paris and sees like a the white landscape of like a picture taken at one of the poles i think it was the north pole yes and he wants to be an arctic explorer and he proposes going to the north pole by balloon and the doctor and martha are attending his lecture and that's where our third dramatic reading is a brief excerpt from this section where the doctor's listing off everything that could go wrong with flying an air balloon (laughs) (laughs) pierre briere spoke to the geographical congress and as he warmed to his subject he forgot to be nervous He explained how a balloon could cover in a few days distances it would take them months with their dogs and sleds. He wasn't wringing his hands any longer. Now he was punching the air with his fist every time he made a point. He sounds convincing enough, Martha had said, a little cautiously. Oh, he's brilliant, said the doctor. You've got to be impressed by the sheer ingenuity of it all. All these people trying to explore the Arctic, this man comes at the problem sideways on. I love sideways on. There's really only one problem. Well, one big problem. Lots of little problems. There are tons of those, of course. What are the little problems? Right, well, for a start, you can't steer a balloon. I mean, you can do a bit with drag ropes, drop them over the side, you get pulled in that direction. But against the Arctic winds? I don't think so, do you? Then there's the gas. At that temperature, you're at the mercy of the sun. When the sun shines, the hydrogen expands, the balloon rises. When it hits a cloud, uh uh-oh, down you go. And then there's the balloon itself, because that's made up of thousands and thousands of silk sheets, all stitched together. Each of the little stitch holes, that's something the gas can leak through, and it will. They don't sound like little problems. Nah, said the doctor, they're pretty small, really. So the doctor and Martha decide that they want to join up with Pierre on this expedition, Mm. uh, despite, I don't know if, if I were Martha and I, you know, the doctor lists everything that goes wrong and that this is probably a one way trip. Um, (laughs) I don't know that I'd volunteer to fly in this balloon and leave the TARDIS behind. No, I don't think I would. I think I'd just say, right, I'll just, yeah, fly the TARDIS there. It'll be nice. It'll be good. Uh, Have we also said that the doctor, um, the doctor's quite puzzled because he believes that Pierre and his companions had vanished without trace three months earlier. Mm. Yeah, he, he's wondering what on earth's going on. I have never been tempted to do a hot air balloon. I've flown in a helicopter, I've flown in a few different types of planes, but the idea of being trapped in a basket with a giant ball of gas and, and sort of naked flame, it doesn't seem relaxing. 
<laughs> the one thing that would appeal to me, I think, and I, I saw this on a, I don't know if you ever saw Stephen Fry Across America, mm. that series. Mm. There, he d- did one episode where he was doing a hot air balloon. And the one thing that did strike me about how cool it would be would just is just how peaceful it is in terms of there not being any sound. So yeah. it's, you know, being able to, apart from occasionally, you know, turning on the, the heater or whatever, just to be, to be able to experience flight without like the noise of engines. And that appeals to me a little bit, but I don't know enough to, to get into one myself either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the health and safety aspects yeah. just put me off. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, so, so they're, they're all having a, 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 a lovely trip. Uh, they're all kind of singing songs and uh, Martha is dreaming of, of kind of like becoming a doctor, but she's kind of, she's also feeling this voice intruding into her dreams and uh, and they wake up and uh, she finds that the balloon is kind of losing height um, at a rapid pace they decide to kind of throw their stores and equipment out in order to lighten the load Um, but it's not until they jettison their food (laughs) that it works and I was like really? we're chucking the food out? okay and uh, the doctor says that some some mysterious force is seems to be kind of like in operation and they all kind of like share their dreams uh, which is interesting because um sometimes we've been told that the doctor doesn't dream yeah he says that in this bit as well um we know that uh the 50th proved that wrong though <laughs> yeah well yeah well he says it and then he sort of says later that he kind of dreams about the unknown and the dangers of it so we're not quite sure what's the truth here pierre also says that, again that he dreams of nothing but expenses of white poor pierre he's a bit of an obsessive isn't he <laughs> And the doctor realizes that they're all kind of experiencing deja vu and Pierre's Mm. writing frantically in his journal. And I I think they come to the realization that, or the doctor mentions that we've been doing this a very long time and we should have reached the North Pole by now. And he's saying that potentially years could have passed, but also that only a couple seconds have passed. And it was kind of getting, it was like a time loop. Not mm-hmm. unlike Heaven Sent, where the same bits are keep playing over and over again. Mm-hmm. And um, the doctor decides to, he looks over the edge and the, the food that they had chucked out was still there from earlier. And it should have been frozen over or they should have moved on or it should mm-hmm. have been covered with snow by this point. But it looks like they had freshly dropped it. And then he tries to, um, I think, pop the balloon, right? Yeah, so his sonic screwdriver. <laughs> and gas is, is kind of still in place there they're they're still hanging there even though the balloons popped by some Mm. external force Mm. so they realize that they're trapped and it's not they're not moving at all of their own volition Mm. and then they look out across the uh the north pole and they see yeah there's dozens of identical balloons uh all containing different versions of pierre with different assistants yes yes yeah that that was that 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 was quite a a shock Mm -hmm. (laughs) i was reading it it made me wonder if Rob Schumann had watched The Prestige before. <laughs> it seemed like a similar sort of conceit there where uh, there are so many duplicates. And it, and it turns out that uh, there's an entity stuck at the North Pole that's mm. been invading their dreams that uh, enticed Pierre to, to come there as a, as a child with the, with the dreams of White. And that this creature, who we don't, we never really learn too much about, but mm. is kind of stocking its larder, and it feeds on human ambition, and uh, is kind of feasting on the the memories and the hopes and dreams of all these explorers that it's trapped at the North Pole. And it takes the uh, Doctor and Martha, both of them, to uh, kind of gorge the entity with their memories mm. in order to get it to to overload. So it's not just I, I was just thinking that the Doctor would be the catalyst, but it turns out it was Martha that was. Mm. Where again, this is written before kind of reminded me of the resolution to uh the monk trilogy this year hmm. where the the doctor tries to overload the net with his memories and it it takes bill and hers to um to overload it for it to happen yeah i hadn't thought of that but yeah no you're right and we never once the time loop breaks we never find out what happens to all the other versions of pierre no we also don't know how, how exactly they get back to the tardis either i don't think mm-hmm. Um, Maybe it's just that it's undone because Pierre instead becomes a hmm. baker. Yeah. Creating uh, powdered donut holes. Yes. <laughs> Lots of icing. <laughs> yeah, um, because like the, you know, the the icing just reminds them of the endless wastes of snow. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. And then they uh, they end up jumping forward uh, a couple years mm-hmm. and Martha 
becomes the first human to the North Pole, and then mm. they jump forward again 200 years later to visit the museum and the gift shop. <laughs> That's a depressing thought, isn't it? Probably yeah. be a bit of bit of green land, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, dear. this one just didn't feel super inspiring to me because the, the underlying message is, you know, hey kid, don't be an explorer, be a content baker instead. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's a bit of pill. It's a great story. I mean, I, it was my favourite story as a collection. Um, Same, think, yeah. Yeah, it was very, very well written. And uh, it makes me a bit sad that um, that Rob Schumann hasn't actually sort of um, written sort of more narratives as opposed to plays. He's written two short story collections mm. that I've read a couple of the stories from. One's called mm. Tiny Deaths and the other's called Love Songs for the Shy and Cynical. Mm. And each collection kind of reads like a... Um, a missing volume of like Twilight Zone episodes. They're yeah. they're both very. They've all got that kind of Rob Sherman twist in them. <laughs> one question I have with this one though is: so as Pierre's like making all these expeditions, you know, one after the other, at some point, do you think like <laughs> the silk shop would say, "Hey, you stopped by nine hundred and ninety nine other times this morning. <laughs> Here's your balloon." <laughs> yes. <laughs> just, I'm just like how, do, how does how does that all work? I just I don't know. I I don't know, but it but it's it, it's beautiful. Also, it's one of the few stories to actually give us any kind of insight into Martha. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and her past, yep. Yeah, you'd have kind of thought that that might have been touched upon. So, you know, reading some of these stories, often it could have been any companion. And whilst, you know, this story, it didn't ha- have to be Martha, but uh, but at least, um, you know, you, you kind of felt that he was wanting just to kind of explore the cast that he was working with. Mm-hmm. Of the four short stories, and even with the framing narrative, it, this felt to me like the strongest hmm. story of the bunch by far. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe the reason why Martha's telling this to the people in the um, labor camp is just to kind of distract them with a compelling story. Mm. Mm-hmm. Maybe it, it's not a cheerful one, but uh, but a bit yeah. of escapism, maybe. Or... Yeah. So, um, should we move back into the into the main framing narrative? Yes. Uh, Martha learns she has a new uh, cellmate on her floor as uh, Griffin, the uh, <laughs> the Overwatch guy who's been pursuing her all this time, has been captured mm. and is one of the workers. He says that he reckons that the um, that the UCF and the Master aren't actually in charge in Japan; that it's something else. Like in the past, his phone link to UCS failed, and um, one of his colleagues was killed by patrol. Martha and Griffin are gradually start to realize that they're going to have to work together if they're going to escape. Every month, the guards come by and they ask for thirty volunteers who are taken to another plant that has a laboratory there, and mm. none of these volunteers ever return back. So it's like a one-way ticket, and they promise the volunteers, "Hey, you'll have your freedom mm. after some time, etc." But it's a, a one-way death sentence. But um, and usually there aren't any volunteers for it. But this time, Martha and a whole bunch of other of Martha's followers who have been protecting her within the camp, as well as Griffin, uh, they volunteer to um, be taken to this other mm-hmm. other place. Yeah, so when they get to uh, this other place, a place called Coban, uh, Martha um, uh, has to kind of strip naked, which it seems a bit gratuitous. Uh, after she's kind of entered the plant, she's kind of singled out and named by this disembodied voice. And it turns out uh, that this plant is being run by a group of aliens called the Drast. And uh, they're very interested in the Doctor and the Master. And they've been trying to infiltrate Japan's uh, tech sector for over a decade. So they're, they're, this is like a slow invasion that uh, the Master's plans kind of disrupted. Yeah, I thought that was quite a genius twist. Really. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, there's other people trying to invade. And the reason her perception filter stopped working is because there's already a filter in place near the domes that are masking the drasts and their um, their invasion plans. So hmm. a f- perception filter within a perception filter kind of cancels itself out, and that's that's why Martha was visible. Yeah. And the drasts are trying to take. They're taking one of the masters black hole converters and are modifying it to become a uh, like a random wormhole generator mm. they the aliens are trying to escape the planet because they realize they can't beat the master but they're just opening this portal to random places and they don't know if it's safe or not for them to escape to so they take one of the volunteers tie a rope around them and send them through it's a bit like time lash isn't it yeah oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so it's a little bit like Time Lash, but with with better effects because you don't have to see the tinsel. Uh, but <laughs> they, they've been doing this for months, and they've mm. run through like close to a hundred people doing this. And Martha sees like a her friends like get sent through, and they pull back like a smoldering rope, and they're like, "Well, that destination didn't work." And you know, it could, <laughs> could be you know the vacuum of space or the inside of a star. Or who knows where they're? You know, it's just random. Martha notices that on the next trial or the next day that Griffin gets selected as uh, the person to who's going to be going through next. And then she tells her final story, um, yes. not to other humans, but in this case to the to the aliens that she's trying to to reason with with the Drast. And Martha's, um, I think, telling this story in an effort to try and get them to be reasonable and empathize with with the humans, which leads us to uh, Star Crossed by Simon Jowett. He's contributed to some of uh the james bond comics and uh oh, okay 2000 ad series hmm. and he's worked on a number of um tv series he's done computer games and uh tie-in books for like finding nemo and wallace and gromit and some other stuff so um yeah he did a a, a comic story for the seventh doctor in the 80s the enlightenment of lai chi the wise marvel uk did this thing called the incredible hulk presents that um i was possibly the only person that had all the issues issues of it went for about 11 or 12 issues uh, and it had um, the hulk um the doctor who and a couple of other randomly selected <laughs> franchises most of the, um, the doctor who material in it was original but some of it did pop up later in doctor who magazine that that one didn't but uh, anyway sorry there's a digression starcrossed yes so we open with a uh, it's a cryogenic ship full of colonists and families that are it's kind of in the dark gulf between solar systems and it's a solar powered ship so its batteries have been depleted Mm. and it opens with this tense standoff between these two different groups and the doctor and martha are on each side of the conflict the doctor is is with the colonists and martha is with the um they're called artificials and Mm. they're they're growing i i was thinking of like the uh the pudding people from uh the matt smith story yes Uh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah the gangers the gangers yes oh what a great story that was Uh. (laughs) talk about a story that didn't need two parts that that one was it's like oh we have a whole another episode of this i remember thinking yeah my heart sank uh, but, uh, yes so yeah, the doctor's kind of meeting the head of the steering council he's been told that uh, the breeds which is a term for these artificials uh, these clones uh, have changed their designated identities and they've kind of been giving themselves kind of human names and so uh, the breed that um, has that captured martha at the start of the story is uh, now going by the name of edison and uh, the breeds are kind of starting to transcend their original programming and edison fell in love with one of the colonists as well mm. uh, one of the women who were there yeah romia yeah and uh, there's this uh, rule that kind of like forbids these relationships and so edison and romia are on the run and um, the colonists want to kind of restart this thing called the fabricator which will provide equipment that they'll need to colonize the world that um, their generation ship's heading to this is where the dramatic reading comes in uh, Mm. for this story it's going through kind of the rules of the artificials on the ship and talks a little bit about there's like a rendering vat where once a artificial has run its course and this reminded me a little bit of like the replicants from blade runner where you Mm. have a very you have a limited lifespan but in this case the replicants or the artificials they have to go back into the rendering vat where their bodies will be broken down and then used for uh new clones martha noticed the young woman squeeze edison's hand as they moved ahead of her along the corridor in front of them moved the rest of the breed Artificials, Martha reminded herself, from the decanting unit. That cramped, slightly smelly room was where Edison and the rest of them were grown and stored. The mouldy smell, Martha had discovered, came from the last of the growth fluid, which had curdled in the curved bottoms of the growth tanks. Martha had been peering into the grey-brown sludge at the bottom of one of the vats when a weird flutter seemed to go through the artificials, as if they were stalks of identical corn being moved by the breeze. Suddenly, they were heading out of the door, led by an Edison look-alike who had introduced himself as Byron. There was a Jason, 
a Curie, and a Demosthenes in the group too, Martha had discovered as they introduced themselves. Once she had stopped hyperventilating at the sight of ten identical copies of the creature she believed had kidnapped and almost killed her. They approached slowly, as if trying to calm a frightened animal. Then the young woman, Romeo, had stepped forward to explain and apologise for Martha's rough treatment. Edison hadn't intended to hurt her, but artificials were stronger than humans. They had to be, as there was no heavy lifting machinery on board. Not yet, anyway. Artificials are forbidden from fraternising with colonists, Edison continued. The rules are quite clear. As, as we were saying, the, the doctor and Martha are separated, mm -hmm. and uh, the doctor's able to kind of get into the, the heads of the artificials. He's using a uh, like a sonic-powered microphone to kind of keep everyone at bay. And while he's doing that, he learns from the pilot ship, kind of the AI programming, that all of the colonists have actually died. And half of the humans died mm -hmm. in, in, their, in their cryo chambers, and then the other half of the colonists were able to be revived, but they were also, um, I guess they transferred their consciousness or yeah i think that's about right yeah they downloaded an imprint of their mm. personalities into clones of themselves so mm -hmm. the twist of this story is that everyone's an artificial mm. and that's kind of where this one ends where the doctor says okay now you all have to get along and i'll yeah. top off your power cells from the tardis so you so you have more energy but i thought this one was an interesting twist i didn't really see that coming where um it turns out they were all yeah i i, I didn't but also i didn't find it particularly kind of like engaging mm. and also it annoyed me because the doctor starts using an alien martial arts and i kind of like oh it's going to be finished you know aikido but no it's amtorian jiu-jitsu i was like oh oh okay <laughs> this yeah. has never been mentioned before <laughs> There was also kind of a weird plot thread that didn't really go anywhere where both the doctor and Martha kept experiencing deja vu throughout the story mm. to the point where I was wondering, like, had they run through this before and were the doctor and Martha also artificials? Mm. But they never did anything with that. It was just kind of a weird one-off where Martha's like, this seems like this has happened before. The other thing I didn't really understand about this story is, again, why, why tell this story to inspire? It's like, <laughs> oh, in the future... <laughs> Humanity all gets killed and replaced by deadly machines, and it's like, hello, that's what the Taclophane are already doing. <laughs> but also, maybe it tells the aliens that look, humanity will overcome. Mm. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Um, it, it's 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 an odd choice. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so. and sure enough, the the Drast who are listening to this in the kind of the framing story, um, <laughs> they're not convinced by it. <laughs> what a surprise! <laughs> and and Griffin is getting ready to go through the the portal as the next victim. He is able to break free, kills some of the guards, and is ready to destroy the wormhole, which would mm. basically blow up the entire chain of um, islands. Yeah, all of Japan. The Drast are kind of forced to um, unmask themselves. Mm which by them shutting down the perception filters, immediately the master's able to pick up on, oh, something's wrong, something's happening mm -hmm. in, in Japan. And then there's kind of a funny aside of as to who tells the master the bad news <laughs> Yes, <laughs> aboard the Valiant. I love that. You know, sometimes in some of the kind of the Star Wars spin-off media, you sort of see things about what it would be like to be like a stormtrooper or something like that. <laughs> yeah, no, pe people are very, very concerned about sort of not giving the master the bad news and... Uh, Griffin's uh, ringing for help, uh, and so he wants the um, the UCF to kind of come and help him. And uh, and like the master, once he does find out, let's put it this way, he is not best pleased um, that the Drast are, um, are are on what he regards as his planet, and so he orders Japan to be burnt. And uh, Martha manages to like escape on a ship, which is the last ship to leave um, before all this happens, and so she she watches um, Japan blaze. Hmm. But uh, and Griffin, in a rather brutal twist, um, he's failed to get his credentials authorized um, by um, the master's people up on the Valiant, and so uh, he gets uh, executed by uh, by the Toplophone. 
uh, which seemed like a suitable end to him. And Martha's able to escape with some of the prisoners uh, because her perception filter starts to work again once the mm. uh, the big ones were shut off. And uh, she heads on, a, like you were saying, she heads on a ship to, uh, to San Diego. So mm. the last six months um, is kind of her touring, you know, North and South America. And then the book ends where it begins, where she is meeting up with Tom Milligan in the, uh, in the UK. So what do you make of that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, uh, overall, I th- thought it was a little bit disjointed. <laughs> The framing narrative took up over half the book, so for me mm. it felt like the balance was was kind of off. I think there either should have been less of a plot in the framing device and you know just have more stories with the Doctor, or just have it be the framing device and flesh out that story a little bit more. I did like how it, it kind of filled in a gap for me, so I feel like now know what you know, Martha experienced during that extra year. Mm-hmm. But um, oh, it was, as you alluded to last month, it was kind of a slog through the, <laughs> through the wastelands. <laughs> I don't know. What did you think of it? Uh, I mean, there's definitely highlights. I mean, I'm very glad that I... I read the Robert Sherman story and and I enjoyed I, yeah, I enjoyed most of of, of the Dan Abnett stuff. That was that was pretty pr- pretty solid and and the Japan scenes were uh, were exciting and gripping. Yeah, I, I just yeah some, some some of the other stories just didn't really come to life. And also in the flashback stories, I don't know if I've ever really got a sense of the tenth Doctor apart from possibly in Starcrossed. There were some moments in that in that final story where yeah I could say yeah this this did feel like yeah I could picture David Tennant um mm. did feel a lot more tenth Doctory. It it wasn't a great success, but I I was glad and and quite pleased that you know. I enjoyed the stuff that's kind of set between Sound of Drums and Last of the Time Lords more than I thought. Mm. Yeah. I did like Freema Adjaman's narration. I thought she was mm. good at that and uh would be nice if she eventually did some big finish stories with mm. David Tennant. I know they've done one volume with Catherine Tate and one with Billy Piper. I think they've reached out to Freema. I think Nick Briggs had mentioned something about that on Radio Free Scarrow, but she just, her agent said she wasn't doing anything Doctor Who related at this point, and I think she's still wrapping up Sense8, uh, her work on that series. But um, mm-hmm. her narration was a highlight for me. But yeah, overall, I, I've i always wanted to read this book because, you know, I was just kind of curious, like, what what did Martha get up to? But I just, the stories that were chosen and, and how it was kind of structurally put together, it just, there was a lot to overcome. And there just wasn't enough content, I think, to make it really compelling. Mm. So anything else you'd want to say about uh, this one? <laughs> no, no that was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to choose a number and then consign it to the list of Doctor Who material, what I've read. <laughs> sure. How would you uh, score this one? Uh, I think I'll give this one a five. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I would be tempted. The frozen waste on its own, I, I think frozen waste helps lift it. To be mm. honest, um, so but I, I think giving it a six would be too generous. Mm. Yeah, sorry, Dan Abner. I was kind of toying between a three and a four. <laughs> So mm. I, I think I'll go with a four. Yeah, it just didn't. It felt like less of the sum of its parts, maybe. Just yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, again, I'm 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 glad I read it, and I I do feel like I I know Martha a little bit more character wise, yeah. which is which is good. Hmm. But um, yeah, onwards and and upwards after this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully so. Yes, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. Let's go ahead and do uh, some listener mail now. Mm, yes. <laughs> We have uh, one letter uh, written in. This is from our listener, Ben, who I think has written in once or twice before. He just had a couple of notes on things we we had said last month in uh, Seeing Eye, Uh, one of which, Chris, you already mentioned. The Dalek speaking German was the fourth (laughs) series finale with Davros and not the... uh, yeah. third series finale sorry <laughs> both had martha dressed in black fatigues going through the wilderness and wasteland so this is true this is true i can see where the mix-up may have come in i've seen journeys end a lot more <laughs> than i have um have last of the time world so i i had the privilege uh, for the 50th um anniversary time to see you know, the fourth season finale at the bfi with the presence of um, Annika Wills and, um, and more relevantly, David Tennant and Catherine Tate, uh, which was just fantastic. It was especially great just seeing that on the big screen. Oh, that would have been great. 
Yeah, really good. Uh, he has a note for myself as well. He said he's a uh, MCU fan, so the that's the Marvel mm. Cinematic Universe. And he states that it was uh, Jarvis was the AI fighting Ultron <laughs> and not Vision. So I stand corrected. <laughs> Whoops. Um, yeah, that was Jarvis. Um, mm. Although I think he kind of morphed into Vision. But... It's, yeah, I think he did. But I was like, I've only seen that film the once and uh, I, I have had no desire to rewatch it. And then um, the last note from his uh, email, it was that uh, the Bainbridge Prison Institute, mm. it also shows up in Kate Orman's novel Blue Box. So oh, okay. I don't yeah. think I've read that one yet, but no interesting no. yeah blue box is one that i i have an eye on it <laughs> that way. i'd quite i'd quite like to do that but having done a kate on one recently it's not going to be anytime soon but uh, hmm. but yeah cool and uh, do you have anything on uh... on facebook yes yes so uh, listener jeff has been in contact and uh, he agrees with your theory that the um, the cats that we saw in seeing eye was the tardis um or a kind of an embodiment of it is uh, and he thinks it's kind of like a callback to uh, cat's cradle um, oh, uh, huh. so. yeah the the reason i thought that was because when the the doctor picks up the cat at one point and has this conversation with it that made me think that he was talking to the tardis hmm. yeah it's never really remarked on or hmm. yeah. yeah it's possibly too subtly done <laughs> maybe maybe something got lost in the edit so uh and so i must confess i've i've not actually looked on on itunes to see if um if there's been any more kind of kind of things said on there so apologies we very much enjoy and appreciate any interactions do please give reviews on on itunes because it helps feed the algorithm and uh, that algorithm is ever hungry so what are we reading next month Chris, it's your yes, yeah. So, uh, so I kind of thought because of you know, the recent Christmas special, that it'd be nice to spend a bit more time with uh, the first Doctor, Ben and Polly, and uh, see see how offensive the first Doctor is. <laughs> 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 see see whether he's he's at all racist and sexist. So we are going to be reading Ten Little Aliens uh, by Stephen Cole. Uh, hmm. That uh, is, uh, I think it's it's set shortly before the tenth planet never read it i know that there is um shall we say an interesting narrative bit in it which i shall say no more but i am looking forward to hmm. how on earth it's done huh. an odd thing that will happen um at one point i'm intrigued and yeah. uh I think Stephen Cole, he became the editor of the range. Was it before yes. or after Justin Richards? Uh, he, yeah, he was before Justin Richards. So he kind of took over the Eighth Doctor and uh, and Past Doctor Adventures fairly early on in their reign, and uh, and so tried to sort of think, well, what do we do about Sam? How do we make this palatable? Um, he's written he's written a few um, novels, uh, and we recently read um, some some of his stuff in short trips because mm. uh, uh, he was uh, at Tara Sam uh, so using that pseudonym for uh, his story I think that was one that was set in Cambridge during the events of Sharda oh right yeah the um, the glass um, creatures or the uh, creatures lurking in the glass hmm. I mean I enjoyed that one more than you uh, from memory but uh, but I, I certainly felt from that that uh, he can write there is a um, shall we say an interesting history of uh, Doctor Who um, book editors commissioning themselves to uh, write a book and uh, and and sometimes it being terrible. Mm. Peter Darvall Evans looking at you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, yes. exciting! I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we yeah. haven't done a first Doctor yet, so that'll no. be that'll be great. Should be good. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, until next month, I've been Matt in Minnesota. Chris and Sam Martin. Happy reading. Thank you for listening to the all-new adventures of the Doctor Who Book Club podcast. Special thanks to George C. Music for use of their song, Doctor Who Theme, Swing Jazz Version. You can follow us on Twitter at ANDWBC Podcast and like us on Facebook. You can support the show by leaving us a rating and review on iTunes. You can contact the show by emailing your thoughts to ANDWBC Podcast at gmail.com. And until next month, happy reading.
Cool, brilliant. That nice. was uh, short and sweet, I think. Yes, <laughs> well, short. <laughs> yeah. oh. yes. This was an odd one. Um, <laughs> I was thinking it was going to be a lot better than it turned out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I said in a message to you, I mean, I, I read half of it uh, on a flight, uh, like a very, very turbulent flight. <laughs> And I was just like, I, I could either switch off my Kindle, uh, I know I need to read this, and just enjoy the choppiness and um, the fact that um, the fastened seatbelt sign is on and I can't move from my seat and there's somebody next to me who's itching to go to the loo. Or, <laughs> or I just, just sort of was like, no, I'll just read this, I'll just read this. <laughs> You just have to power on through the wasteland. <laughs> yes, you do. You do. Oh, oh, joy.